can you put the um, outline up on up on the screen? Because unfortunately, every time I try to share my screen, uh, Google Chrome crashes the tab. It's in the email. Uh, oh, actually, oh, I'm okay. able to. Okay, so so it's, it's in the email you sent me. The outline. Yes. Okay, I will I will share the 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 the. the outline just yeah, wait, just wait me a bit uh, yeah yeah that, just just wait me a bit i tested the phone connection but didn't test the laptop connection because i assumed google chrome would work with google service yeah 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 just just, just give me a second sorry 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 it, this is whole fiasco is just okay 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 so that's me, and if you scroll down to the, uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to try to go real fast because there's a whole lot to cover. If you go down to the talk sections, um, what I'd like to cover right at the start here that I hope to give you a video for was, what is Makeroot? Um, I'm going to walk you through downloading and running pre-built binaries, um, walk you through building it from source, and then a quick code walkthrough of Makeroot.sh on GitHub. You know, I, I have a lot more prepared, but without being able to share the screen, let's not even try that. So if you scroll down, yeah, introduction, the view from orbit, uh, what is Makeroot? Makeroot is a tiny system builder. It is a 300 line bash script. If you look up at those links at the top, the project source, uh, github.com slash Landly slash Toybox, if you go there, and in the subdirectory makeroot, there's a file makeroot.sh. In the subdirectory makeroot, there's a file makeroot.sh. Yeah. Okay. This 309 lines builds a system that you can boot from sort. It builds a system that you can boot to a shell prompt and do basic Linux things with under QEMU. And he can build it for a dozen different hardware architectures. And let me walk you through. Uh, if you go back to the outline, sorry to uh, take up so much of your time, uh, the guy running the screen. If you go back down to uh, use binaries, it assumes you have QEMU-system installed. That's the Debian name for the package. Um, Red Hat has a different name, but it basically assumes that you have the QEMU system emulators installed on the system you're going to be playing with this on. And then if you grab one of the tarballs, um, the latest link there isn't actually quite the latest, but it'll, it'll be good enough. I was uh, putting together a new release of this project uh, for this talk, and life intervened. I still intend to do it this weekend. Uh, but that's the previous release, it should work fine. So if you wget that file into, you know, just make dir empty, cd empty, and wget that URL, uh, if someone can... Do you have a command prompt there? A Linux one? If you're doing this on a Windows system, it's going to be a little uh, hiccupy. I mean, I can, I can probably film my screen, which is truly ridiculous. Let's see, how does that work? Yes, I can film my screen. This is deeply silly. So it's fetching the thing and then tar xvf m68k and cd m68k uh let, let me get the let, let me let me grab the new one i simplified this a lot before the talk and i'd like to describe the the current stuff actually so um so rob we're, we're actually uh, using your we're broadcasting your phone re webcam so maybe you can just hold yes. your hold, hold your phone and I'm, film your screen <laughs> i'm i'm going to but i need to uh, i need to download something yeah, that's what I'm going to, but I need to, to download the, the new version. 
um, because here, let me do that to show you what I'm typing. Um, if we go to langley.net slash bin, I made quick links to get, to get us to all this stuff. And if we go to the make root directory there, and then 0810 is the new release I'm doing, latest still points to 089. So if I grab any of these, let's see, PowerPC, yay, PowerPC. And let's go back to wget and paste that. wget. I don't know why the net is so much slower than it was uh, earlier today. This is a fiber connection. Anyway, I'm going to cheat slightly because I just... Toy box, clean root. I just built all of these, so I uploaded them to the website. So if you go to M68, well, let me actually make their sub, CD sub, tar xdf M68K. Dot tar, and then cd to m68k. Any of these architectures should work the same. There are three files at the top level that collectively will boot. If I just run qemu.sh, it will boot a little emulated m68k system to a shell prompt. Cat proc cpu info that thinks it's running M68K, and then if I type exit, it will drop back out. If I cat the QEMU, uh, sorry, the run script, that is the QEMU invocation. Let me see if I can get it focused. Um, QEMU-system-whatever architecture we're emulating, what kind of machine it is, 256 megs of RAM, the dollar sign at symbol says anything that is added to the command line of the script gets thrown into the command line there so you can provide extra arguments to QEMU. No graphic says set it up to do a machine with a serial console connected to standard in and standard out, which is what we want to do. Uh, no reboot says if the emulated system tries to reboot, exit the emulator instead. Um, the kernel is the file Linux kernel. That's what we, that's what the script built. Uh, dash initrd says provide, you know, using QEMU's built-in fake bootloader, provide this file as if it was an initrd file, and the Linux kernel will recognize this is a gzip CPIO archive and extract it into an ramfs. That's a kernel thing. And then the dash append says this is your kernel command line. You know how the Linux kernel has command line options that you can feed it through the bootloader? Well, we are feeding it console equals TTYS0, so it knows that it should connect its console to the serial port because it doesn't do that by default for some reason, even when the serial port is the only console you give it. Uh, panic equals one says if the kernel panics, exit at, or try to reboot after one second and the no reboot will turn that into QEMU exit. So if the emulated kernel panics, the emulator will exit instead of hanging and have to be killed from another terminal. And then that dollar sign kargs at the end, uh, this bit here, says if I set an environment variable kargs, it will be passed to the emulated kernel as extra arguments. So if I go kargs equals a, b, c equals d, e, f, and let me actually quote that and go a, b, c equals d, e, f, g, h, i equals j, k, l. And then if I tell it dash m512, which is a QEMU thing to say allocate twice as much memory, then if I go env, it says uh, ghi equals jkl um, 
and there's the ABC equals DEF. Those are your cat proc CMD line. That is the kernel command line that the emulated system got. The things I added by that environment variable are there. And um, uh, head proc meminfo. Stop it. I don't have command line editing uh, enabled here. Um, it, it thinks it has twice as much memory because the QEMU thing. So exit that. So that's a simple basic grabbing the pre-built binaries and playing around with them. I could, for example, do dash HDA equals, um, well, let's, let's give it a file. If we look in the docs subdirectory, readme, uh, here is the readme that is shipped in each of these tarballs, which basically tells you about KARGs, tells you about uh, adding extra things to the command line, and then if you want to extract this initramfs.cpo.gz back into an editable file system and then recreate the archive version of it, there's the command lines to do so. What I can actually do is I can say hda equals docs readme, and then as soon as it finishes booting, ls-l dev, and uh, ls dev, let me not do the dash l, and on this system, it's SDA rather than HDA because the block devices have weird names. I often do slash dev slash question mark DA because that's going to be the first hard drive on almost all these systems. There's also a VDA for Vertio. Uh, but if I go cat dev SDA, I get that readme because that's the external file I attached it to. This is actually writable. I could. I could write it back. So, and uh, QEMU has all sorts of documentation. Uh, there's there's a variant of it called KVM, which is basically a hardware accelerated version. Um, but if you go and use the run thing, an interesting thing is I can just go help here, and it will give me the QEMU help because it passed along dash dash help to QEMU. And that told QEMU, ignore all your other command line arg arguments, just give me a dump of the help text. So if you're wondering what you can do with QEMU, there's that. So back to the outline. So that is using the pre-built binaries, just grabbing them, playing around with them. You have tiny little emulated systems for a bunch of different architectures. So if you want to see what does PowerPC work like, what does... Uh, IBM 64-bit S390 work like. There's there's a dozen little systems there, and it's not too hard to add more. Uh, now let's build one of those from source. So what I do is rm-rfmccak, because I want an empty directory, and now I wget one of the directories out of slash bin slash toolchains. And again, it's not slash latest because I haven't updated that link yet, although those old toolchains would probably work exactly the same way. They're just uh, GCC 9 something instead of GCC 11 something. But if I grab, uh, let's say, well, I mentioned S390. So notice that there are cross and native compilers for each of these. Um, because it alphabetizes them, the cross compiler is always the first one, so even if it's scrolled off the right edge, it's cross and native, or you can see it down at the bottom of the screen there. Um, there's also this big tarball, 1.7 gigs, which would take forever to download in the current, uh, with, with my net being this slow for some reason. Uh, is it because I'm doing the streaming thing? Is that why my net is slow? It's fiber. It's supposed to be fast. But if I wget tarball no that's way that's way too slow i'm i'm just going to cheat because i do actually already have them here so let me go to clean so what the outline says to do is 
uh, grab the Linux kernel source. You can kind of assume you have Linux kernel source lying around. It's Linux kernel source. It's pretty common. Uh, clone the Toybox project um, because Makeroot was merged into Toybox about three years ago. It used to be a standalone thing, but it it was easier to just merge them together because it builds two packages, Toybox and Linux. And if I just have them say, here's your Linux kernel source code on the command line and it lives in Toybox, then the simple builds don't actually have to download anything. So the whole problem of source management just went away. There is a package system in this, um, in the Makeroot stuff, there's packages. Um, so you can add packages to build on the command line and like drop bear is one of the big ones that I probably won't have uh, too much time to go into. I am so sorry about the video quality of this. Um, but this is an example of, you know, it can download more packages. Uh, it can extract them. Set up for is basically tar extract and CD into the directory. It's, you know, with a little error checking. And then do whatever you need to do to build it in there. And, you know, here's setting up for a second one because this one builds Zlib. And then this one builds Dropbear telling it where it just built Zlib. So if I cross compiled it for MIPS or something, well, here's a MIPS version of Zlib. Here is Dropbear being built and configured. Dropbear is, uh, Dropbear is an embedded SSH uh, server and client. It's very s small and simple and straightforward. And I added it as an example, both because here's how you build a reasonably complex package and because being able to add SSH to these systems is, you know, kind of nice. Um, let me try to get back to that at the end. That's that's a bit of a tangent. But, you know, you can add packages. Um, but what we're going to try to do here is, if I have the toy box source, I can just go make root slash make root with no arguments, and it will use my host compiler to build a toy box, which is, it's my successor to BusyBox. I used to maintain BusyBox, um, and then I left that project in 2006 and started over from scratch. Um, Toybox is another implementation of all the standard command line utilities. It's, uh, it's what Android has been using as its command line since uh, 2015. It was merged into Android Marshmallow. Um, if you want to use BusyBox instead, there is one of those packages I mentioned is is a BusyBox build that will put it, uh, I think, after Toybox in the path, but you can tweak that pretty easily to have it before or just, you know, instead of. Uh, it, it's the same general idea. It's just you have to download an external package, and I don't uh, work on that one anymore. But it, it built the thing, and notice there's eight gazillion warnings. And the warnings are because my host toolchain is a glibc toolchain, and by default, this is statically linking. And the previous maintainer of glibc, Ulrich Drepper, personally hated static linking and intentionally sabotaged it in glibc. And this is why I mostly build with muscle libc uh, cross compilers or uh, the Android NDK works. It works fine against Bionic. Uh, static linking is reasonably functional there. Um, but in glibc, you'll notice how it's saying, I can't call get pw now, meaning if I run the ls-l in there, it won't know, it will say 00, zero instead of root root for files that belong to the root user because it can't look up the names. Um, here, uh, get adder info. Uh, that's not available to glibc in static linking because well, it's basically because Ulrich Drepper hated it, and it's also because the static version is trying to DL open NSS libraries in order to implement this. And you can't use DL open from a statically linked program because then you have two heaps, the variable that, that keeps track of where malloc is getting its memory from, the whole tree structure. There's one statically linked into the program, and there's one in the copy of libc that the library you're pulling in will itself link against. So you now have two heaps, and as soon as you free, as soon as you allocate from one and free into the other, you've corrupted memory, and bad things happen. And they never should have done that. It was a design flaw, 
and there's ways to work around it, but I have fixes for this. I haven't finished implementing them yet because A, I don't do too much with glibc. I just use muscle where this isn't a problem. If, if my host thing here was like Alpine Linux, which is muscle based, this wouldn't have come up. But it's just, if, if you do that with glibc, it, it's gonna, there are ways to fix it, but it would take about half an hour to explain what the problems are because Ulrich Drepper did fairly extensively sabotage static linking and glibc. If you statically link a hello world binary, against glibc the result is 700 kilobytes it, it's like he, he he really broke a lot of stuff and it was intentional because anyway so if I, that is if i do it with no arguments there are two interesting arguments i can add right now one of which is cross cross equals help and if I say that, it will go, these are the architectures I know about because in the CCC directory, remember that big tarball I talked about? These are the cross compilers that have been installed that it could find. Now, I could also say cross compile equals path to, if you've ever done cross compiling for and you know about cross compiling prefixes, that cross compile works the same way that the Linux kernel does, you feed it one of those prefixes that ends with minus, and the script will figure out what to do from there as well. Um, but if I try to build it, I, I don't have time right now. So let me just build a root file system with cross equals, uh, I mentioned S390X. So this should build, what it's doing is uh, it it's, Billion airlock step that is that is a hermetic build. I will I will try to explain this, but I'm I'm unfortunately I'm not doing very good time management here. So it is actually all in these things. I I did lots and lots of outline explaining all of this stuff that I really thought I had a reasonable chance of getting through this talk in the half hour. Yeah, best laid plans of mice and men are usually equal. Um, so, and I, because I upgraded from GCC 9 to GCC 11 right before this talk, it is, of course, finding new warnings that it wasn't complaining about before. So, of course. So, if I cd into root and then cd s390x, and then under here is an fs directory. And that if I go um, file bin slash toy box. Um, file bin slash toy box. It says this is IBM S390 code. Now I can actually run this because if I installed the QEMU package I mentioned at the start, it will have installed both QEMU system emulation and QEMU application emulation. And QEMU ap application emulation, instead of faking a system that it runs in a VM, it grabs an ELF binary for a foreign architecture, runs it in the emulator, and translates all the system calls. So if I actually do that, I can go um, uname-m, for example, and it will, it thinks it's S390X. Unfortunately, if I also go cat proc CPU info, the host system is still saying that it's x86-64 because the system, the, the application emulation has hundreds of system calls Application emulation is a lot more brittle than system emulation. There's a reason that I do system emulation. There's a reason this thing builds system emulation. All right. Um, let me really quickly, I got to skip through most of this stuff. Um, let me jump to the uh, github.com. And let me go into the makeroot file because I'm just not going to have time for the rest of it. Uh, makeroot. 
Makerit. Real quick, Makerit.sh is a self-contained file. It doesn't call anything else in here unless you list packages on the command line, in which case it'll pull stuff out of this directory. Um, okay, record commands is a wrapper that it lets you wrap the command line, you know, uh, it, it lets you change the path so that the first thing in the path is symlink versions of all the command names that talk to a, a binary called log path that will append the name it was called under and its command line arguments to a log file and then call the second instance of that command out of the path. So everything we run during the build is actually, uh, I can show examples of this in the build I did just before this talk. Uh, if I go into build log, If I go like a uh, cat, uh, there's, um, well, for example, microblaze commands, uh, let me see, SH4 commands, commands. That's all the command lines that were run by the build. So I can, you know, run grep and set against that. I can get, here's all the commands that were actually run. If something doesn't work right, I can figure out what the specific failure was and what it was trying to do. So that's, you know, fairly useful logging to me. Um, but it's optional. You can, you can switch all this stuff off. Tar for web just makes those tarballs that I uploaded to the thing and adds to readme files. Um, and then test root is something that I really wanted to go into, but I don't have time, but it, it shows you how to run these system images as child programs that do something specific. Instead of just giving you a command prompt, uh, what this one does is it makes a little squashfs file with a script, makes squashfs, and then that squashfs file has a slash init in it, and the make root init thing, if you give it an HDA, it'll try to mount it on slash MNT and look to see if it has a slash init file in it. And if so, it will run that instead of firing up a shell prompt, which means I can tell it to just do all sorts of automated stuff. And this is, you know, I, I ran uh, an HTTPD instance. This is basically a, a weird inetd. Um, and then I, I did a quick test to see if I can fetch that. And what this does is this is a smoke test for all the QEMU system images after I build them uh, to say, here, I can actually, uh, well, that, I'm not going to do it right now. I don't have time. But it will basically say, um, can it run stuff? Does the virtual network work? Is the clock set sanely? Because you can't run make if your source code is newer than the current timestamp. Make will just go nuts. Um, but it does some basic smoke tests to say, yes, I mounted a block device. You know, the kernel that I built with the compiler that I built and the toy box binaries that I built running under this QEMU version are all coming together and sort of basically working. So this is a smoke test I run after every build, but it's also an example of how to run these, these system images in an automated fashion to do arbitrary stuff. All right. Um, I am going to ask for questions, and then I'm going to do, like, I'm going to try to cover the whole... Uh, what? I didn't hear. Oh, sorry. I, I heard uh, that you... uh, please go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to... No, please go ahead. Okay. Um, in that case, I'm going to real quickly... Uh, let's back up from test root. This, this was basically me, you know, showing you what the other files are in here. I'm going to end with make root because, you know, that's great. Here are the packages that I uploaded. You can add all sorts of, of new packages if you want to. I, I walked you through drop a little bit. There's one that does BusyBox. There's one that will do basic dynamic linking, but it is still really fragile and funky. And I, I, I need to make that file at least three times as big in order for it to merely suck. Um, Overlay is a fun, simple one. That will basically copy a directory. Um, so if you haven't set overlay, this is the bash syntax to provide a default value. So overlay in the current directory or 
overlay if you set an environment variable and it will copy it into the new root file system we're creating so you can add arbitrary files so that instead of starting with an empty directory you start with you know those files um, plumbing if you add any of these other packages it will insert plumbing at the start and this just declares uh, three functions and a variable the variable is uh, a destination directory to download source packages into. Download is a wrapper around wget that does an SHA1 sum, and if the file that's there matches the SHA1 sum, it just keeps it, and if not, it you know deletes it if it exists and tries to wget it from the URL. So this has two, two arguments. It has an SHA1 sum and it has a URL. Um, set up for is basically tar extract and CD into the directory and remember where we were, and then clean up is whatever the last directory that we did the setup for, rm-rf it because we're done with it now. So those are just some real simple thing and that's my very simple, you, you remember that DropBear was doing download, setup for, and cleanup. Well, that, that came out of there. So, let's go through makeroot.sh. There are three main sections of it and if you look in the outline, um, the second half of this is a walkthrough of setup. You know, here's what every, you know, here's some design decisions right at the start. Here's what every, every variable means. These are the ones that uh, you kind of want to set on the command line. These are ones that it will provide a default value for if you don't, uh, you know, it, if you don't set them on the command line, it will provide a good default value for those. And then these are ones you can set that will disable steps that I'm about to go through. And then these things are set in the, in the kernel build later on, and um, these are set by some of the package builds. So in the setup, let's go through, uh, let me go through the one with the syntax highlighting because that'll make it easier for you to see. Um, okay, so three parts. Part one, the first thing it does is if you haven't set no clear, it will env-i itself. It will, it will exec env-i itself. env-i clears the environment space, and then it passes along these environment variables. So these are the only environment variables it will inherit out of the host environment, uh, and that's for portability. There's, I've done a lot of cross-compiling, and there's all sorts of weird stuff in people's environments that break stuff. Um, if if it doesn't see a makeroot directory under us, it says you need to run it at the top level directory of Toybox or it's going to get confused. And then it loops through the command line arguments we gave it, and if there's an equal sign in it, it exports that as an environment variable in the current environment, and otherwise it adds it to, that, to the list of packages it's going to build out of that subdirectory. And what this means is you can set any environment variables on the command line so the filtering out that it did here doesn't mean that you can't set that variable, you just have to set it on the command line. Uh, next, it sets default values for a bunch of those things, and it, in, in here it, it says what all those are, and I just don't have time, sorry. Um, and then, are we cross-compiling? There are two variables you can set that say, yes, we're cross-compiling. If you set cross-compile, and you didn't set cross, then it will set cross to everything out of cross-compile after the last slash, but before the first minus sign after that. So you'll notice that if I went make root, make root, make root, make root, and then cross equals basically anything it doesn't understand, it will list the available architectures. Those are the cross values and then cross compile is the path is is the absolute path to that cross compiler prefix and it basically what it does is it finds the cc file and then it chops the cc back off so you can add dash ld dash uh dash nm you know whatever other tool it needs dash as so if you set cross compile it can set cross from it but will accept a different cross if you supply both Otherwise, if you set just cross, it will calculate a cross compile value by looking in that CCC directory. And if it can find a compiler, it will use it. 
if it uh, can't find a compiler, it will list the available targets, which it got up here by basically listing the thing and then running set against it to go, here are the things that look like cross compilers under there. And there's also a magic value of all. So if you say cross equals all, it will loop through all of those targets and call itself recursively. Okay? And there's even a special all nonstop that, you know, if you just say all, it will stop at the first architecture that fails to build. It will stop at the first error. All nonstop will log all the errors, but it will basically just try to build everything. So, uh, then it sets more directory names, which it couldn't calculate until... Scott, so we're, we're running a bit short on time. Okay. Um, hopefully, between the outline and the, and the file, you can make it through there. Um, I, I will try to do a proper version of this and put it up on YouTube, because I do owe you the, the oh, talk that I was trying to do. do. I think okay. Questions no. or tell me we're out of time. I'm here for questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, but uh, okay. Well, I have one. Uh, I have one question that, Rob, is it possible that you can integrate a uh, clan LLVN into NK root? Uh, that I can integrate what? Clan and LLVN. Um, I have actually built with LLVM uh, my hexagon toolchain is an LLVM toolchain, and I mentioned the Android NDK as one of the things that I build with. That is an LLVM Bionic toolchain, and those work fine. I haven't actually, I, I have a patch, um, I, I have a pile of patches, but if I go to landly.net slash bin, and then go to uh, make root and go to the previous release. There's a Linux patches directory where I had several patches. I now have like twice as many of these, but um, one of them is um, the Linux kernel build should be able to just find the CC file out of the path and run whatever compiler that symlink points to. And I have a two-line patch that makes it do that, in which case it auto-detects whether it's LLVM or GCC, because it's already got plumbing to do that, and everything just works. Without that patch, you need to say capital LLVM equals one on the Linux kernel build in order to use the magic name Clang instead of using the magic name GCC. The other thing you can do is make a GCC symlink to your Clang, and then the kernel builds. I have been arguing with the kernel developers about that for a year and a half because they decided we're going to default to GCC and you specify LLVM on the command line if you want to use LLVM, and even though this could be easily auto-detected, we don't want to. And I have yet to get them to explain why they don't want to other than we made a decision. So, fun. But yes, LLVM works. Bionic works, Muscle works, glibc almost works. I see. Thank you a lot, because currently on, uh, we are running out of time, but thank you for giving me This is very useful for embedded Linux and developers such as me. So, uh, let us give a big applause to the author of PCBox and Toybox. <laughs> okay, so, bye-bye. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.